Welcome to a special edition of the Growth Podcast. As you can see, we're out of our, our, our comfort zone. Uh, when we do that, it means we followed um, a really big shot somewhere and we finally are recording um, this podcast uh, today um, after so many postponements, but it's understood. <laughs> uh, yeah, and my guest uh, is the Chief Executive Officer of Zanako. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you. And I do apologize for the postponement. No, I mean, <laughs> anyone would understand. Okay. Like, I, like, even I was disappointed. I was like, Ugh, anyway, yeah. yeah. But we, and finally, 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 we're here. Finally, we're here. How have you been? I've, good, I've been good, thanks. And you? Um, I'm okay. And how is the big red bank? It's great. It's good. Mm. Yeah, no. With it's, your support, it's as always. Uh, yeah, no. Yeah. I mean, support local. Um... <laughs> Before I start our conversation, uh, I have Kickstarter questions. Yeah. Um, I've got cards here. Um, for you, I got a lot of them because I'm giving you choice. So these are just like, <laughs> like conversation starters. Okay. Um, I want you to pick any, any three. Um, okay. Pick any three. Uh, read out. No, don't, don't look at them. That aside. Yes, you should even see them. So pick any three. <laughs> okay. Uh, and, and there's a question, then you ask the question, then you answer it yourself. Any three. So does what's showing on the other side mean anything? Uh, it's just a category, but doesn't really tell you what, what the questions okay. are. Okay. Okay. I'll pick. Okay. Give me the others. All right. So there are three questions there. Ask one. Give us an answer. Okay. Describe a life lesson that took you more than once to learn. Yeah. Trusting people. You were disappointed so many times. So many times. And I still do it. <laughs> <laughs> You're a good person. Maybe that's why. I know, right? I'll try. Yeah. I think we all just try. Yeah, I mean, you can't reach a point where like, I just stop yeah. trusting people. That's yeah. a point of trust. You just someone. have to. Describe an aha moment where you finally recognized how a past moment shaped you. I think in my current role, when I look back, um, various past moments have helped to determine how I respond and actually respond rather than react to whatever comes my way. So I think that is a number of aha moments for me. Okay. What's the best mistake you've ever made and why? Maybe having this podcast. <laughs> How is this a mistake? <laughs> it's a mistake because you're asking me tough questions already. And to do And why? Every mistake is a growth experience. Yeah. So at that point, it may appear to be a mistake, but everything we go through is an opportunity to learn. And it's up to us as to what we make of it. Yeah, I'm actually looking forward to learning from this mistake of yours that you're learning <laughs> from it. Uh, yeah, so the guys are kind enough to give me as an alcohol folder uh, where I wrote my questions. Guys, Cheers. I wrote questions and I printed them like, you know, came in all serious. Um, <laughs> Mukwandi, uh, yes. who is Mukwandi? For those that, you know, just know the Zanako Sea or where have you come from? I'm actually a Zambian born and bred and I'm very proud of that um, because a lot of the time, even now, just a few days ago, I was engaging um, some parties and they were asking, have you always been in Zambia? Have you always lived in Zambia? It's like they're looking for an excuse for me to be in this position. But there's nothing wrong with being Zambian and having been born and bred in Zambia and still achieving what I have achieved so far. So I'm very proud of that. Um, I was raised here in Lusaka in McKinney on a farm and um, with my sisters. My father happened to work for the government of Zambia. He was the deputy secretary to the cabinet and then eventually Comessa. When they set up Comessa, he was part of that team. He was a director there. And then my mother uh, also in Lusaka with the city council. You know, funny enough, my daughter was saying to me as the, the other day, I would like to work for the city council. I said, did you know that your grandmother worked there? So she says, no, I just, I just like it. I just want to work there. So I said, I'm not sure that you want to, but uh, let's see. Let's see what happens in life. So at the end of the day, we, we were raised uh, through hard work. Uh, we were raised to respect um, other human beings. And eventually I got married to Chita Chwesakunda, and we have four lovely children together. We've also tried to instill those values in them as best we can. Um, but that's really who I am and where I've come from. Over the years, I went into banking. I studied economics, 
went into banking, started my career through various other banks. I've worked for a few and I've ended up here. So I encourage anyone out there who may be looking at where they're going to say it's actually possible. And for me, actually, um, even this is not the limit. Um, we should always be looking at what, what more we can do uh, to contribute to our community, to contribute to the people around us, contribute to our families, and just make a difference. Okay. What, what was your first job? I was, uh, actually, my first ever job was with Zesco. And I was reminded of that most recently. Um, during my student life, during my vacation, I was employed by Zesco. And my first paycheck, um, I bought a gift for my parents. And they were so pleased. They said, oh, all your other sisters didn't do this. <laughs> <laughs> so um, that was my first job. And then after I finished university, I then joined Standard Chartered. Okay. And as a management trainee and grew. I mean, uh, it was a great run that I had there. And it set me up for my future banking career. So I'm grateful. Okay. So when you stepped into your first job, did mm. you ever see yourself like CEO or you're just like, let's see what this costs? Funny enough, at that time, I remember having a discussion with one of the, the managers um, who at the time seemed to be the controller of everything. And he said to me, oh, you new graduates, you, you believe that you'll change the world. You won't. You will just rot in this position as teller. So just be ready for that. And I wonder sometimes when I look back if he was alive to see what was possible. Because sometimes we even um, break people's hearts by telling them the wrong thing at a particular point in their career. We should always encourage each other that there is a possibility. Yes, it's all, there's also a possibility that you don't get there, but there is a possibility that you will, and we should just encourage one another. So at that point, when I first joined banking, it was unusual to even have a woman manager let alone managing director. So it never occurred to me that I could be at that point. And even the people around me were not encouraging that. But I just thought, okay, let's see how far this goes. Okay. Hmm. Would you say you took some deliberate steps for you to get here? Um, and what steps were those? Like just from the get-go, you know, your ambition and your drive. What, what deliberate steps did you take for you to rise through the ranks and file of the corporate world? I think what was clear to me from the onset was that hard work would pay. And that is really what I focused on. Sometimes it wasn't even intentional. I'll be lying if I said from the on onset, this is what my vision was for myself. No. Um, over the years, that's when I realized, okay, this is possible. And um, then at each point, I was looking at the next, what is my next thing? What, what is likely and sometimes I was disappointed, hey? Even if I had set my heart on something, sometimes I didn't get it. But life is a journey that has twists and turns. And so you have to allow for those twists and turns and allow God to lead you through. And I think that's what worked for me. Okay. You are CEO and like you said, you started out in, in, the, in, in the branch as a teller. Right now, if you went downstairs to the branch and you looked at your tellers, are you able to tell that this one is going far, this one's not going far, and what differentiates those that you can say, this one I think has got a future in banking, they'll, they'll eventually rise? You never can tell just by looking, but you can tell by attitude. I think attitude is, is a lot of the hard work already. And uh, beyond attitude, it's delivery, it's consistency, it's belief because you have to believe and and then the rest just follows okay. so I, I wouldn't be able to go to the tellers in the in the branches and say oh you will you won't no um it's really up to each of them more than up to me okay your, your first ceo role how do you feel when you first you know go, oh you're not ceo it was a tough job. <laughs> My first CEO role was Access Bank, and we were just setting up. Um, and 
you know, I could see where we could end up, but uh, it was also a very scary journey. And I was thinking, Kwani, what have you done? And I remember uh, traveling to Nigeria for my immersion uh, to understand the institution and to really learn. And um, they gave me an allowance in cash for the time that I was there in dollars. And I put it in my purse and I changed some of it. And then um, they gave me a driver to drive me around. And I went to the shops, ShopRite. There was already ShopRite in uh, Lagos then. When I went to the shops to buy a few things, I picked some things and got to the counter and my purse wasn't in my handbag. And I thought, oh my goodness, what does this mean? Already? I haven't even been here for a week. Someone has stolen my purse. All sorts of things went through my mind, but then I thought, okay. I had to leave the things that I had picked because I couldn't pay for them. I went and asked the driver who was with me at the time. I asked him, did you see my purse anywhere? And he says, no, ma'am. Very polite. So we drove all the way back to where I was staying. And as I was just coming out of the car, the gentleman who was the gardener in that location came running to the car. Ma, you dropped your purse in the morning. Every single note was there. That's how I lost my fear. That's how I decided I'll give everyone a chance and I'll give this job my best shot. And I did. And we grew that bank at the time when we were, when I was taking over leading it. Uh, I think there were 15 banks in the market. We were 15th. By the time I left, we were 6th. What is the Mukwandi effect? Like, do you feel like you've got this Mukwandi effect? Because now Zanako is doing one billion. And if it happened tomorrow, we're not surprised anymore. Like, is there like some kind of Mukwandi magic wand that you just, you know, <laughs> no. go to every floor and just, you no. know, stretch it? There is no magic wand. I just believe in people. And I don't take anything for granted. And um, I trust God as well, as I said earlier. And I just try my best. That's all. Other people do that as well. But they're not doing one billion. Some are. It, it, at the end of the day, the, the intention is not for us to not succeed in whatever we're doing. The intention is for all of us as much as possible to succeed. When the pie is bigger, you stand a better chance. So... We need to grow the Zambian economy so that all of us stand a better chance. It's not about me. It's about all of us together. You mentioned something about giving people a chance. And I'll be very honest with you. The people I have interacted with and spoken with about you speak glowingly. <laughs> like, you know, I've, they speak very highly of you. The first time I spoke to someone was when I spoke to Patricia. And she spoke very, like, the things she said, like... <laughs> I, I, I don't know you don't I know you don't watch podcasts, but you should watch that one. <laughs> and and she said, you know, all these things you did for her, opportunities you gave her, you would take her, I mean, ask her to go and speak at these events and you show up secretly and observe her and come yeah. back to the office and give her feedback. And yeah. the majority of Zambians do not know what it feels like to have a boss like that. Oh. Because most people are in very toxic work environments. You've got bosses that really want to stunt your growth. Mm. They want to block you. They don't want you to rise above them and all those, all these sort of environments. How do I become a Mukwandi kind of manager? Allow people to grow around you. You know, um, a lot of the time, I actually avoid speaking engagements. I prefer for my people to grow. I prefer for the people around me to also be part of the success that we're achieving, because it's not just me. It's a whole team effort. And I recognize that, and I try to bring it out in others. So, for example, Patricia, at that time when, when we were running NatSave, um, the institution was at rock bottom, and we had to find a way to inspire. And together we did. And look at what's happening there. I'm so proud of what they're still doing now, because... For me, their success is my success. Uh, and it starts with that, you know. 
Don't begrudge other people their journey. Help to build them and get them ready for that journey. Because it doesn't, it doesn't hurt you to do that. And sometimes people focus on the wrong thing. You know, if I stunt someone else's growth, then I'll grow better. No, actually. If you allow others to grow, then you grow too. And that's my philosophy. It doesn't mean that I haven't, I'm not tough. I'm a tough person. I'm, I'm a tough manager. I know that. I ask of others what I expect of myself. And if you're not able to cut it, then it's very difficult to be part of my team. But if you're ready to rise to the challenge, we'll grow together. Okay. Obviously, you've hired a lot of people. Mm -hmm. you, you've sat in a lot of interviews as CEO. What do you look out for in people? Because there's one CEO I was talking to and he told me, I don't believe in this advertise, then recruit. We never get the right people. You've done that. And obviously, you've ended up with the right people. How do you, what do you look for in, in someone? Even just from one, the first interview. Mm. You can, sometimes you can tell, this is our guy, this is our lady. How does it work for you? It's about energy. Everyone is the right person. It's just, is the chemistry right for the other people around them? So I don't, I don't subscribe to the philosophy that they are right people. I subscribe to the philosophy that there is a right team of people together. And if you're able to achieve that, then that chemistry will make things work. So even when I meet people and interview them, I look for that chemistry rather than the textbook answer. And it's about attitude, it's about delivery, it's about loyalty. All those are things that I pay attention to. You mentioned that you're, you're tough um, as, as, as a supervisor. How do you balance between being tough and being nice? Because from the things I've heard, you're nice also. Mm. How do you balance the two without reaching a level where now people begin to take you for granted? They feel yeah. like become too familiar, you know, lines become blurred and the work's not moving because I feel like the boss is my friend. You know, it's about being professional because the targets are the targets, right? So if you're achieving the targets, it's not about whether I like you or not. It's about you achieving the targets. If you're not achieving the targets, again, it's not about whether I like you or not. It's about the targets. So there's a difference between um, the delivery and the person. And I try to just make sure that that is clear and that it, my intention of coming from the right place is also very clear. I try to be kind, you know, because I think as human beings, we're called to be kind. Even when I'm giving tough feedback, I try to be kind. But obviously, sometimes constructive feedback is tough to take, even if it's given in the kindest of ways. And so you get some reactions at times. But if you treat people with respect and with kindness, and you're able to still be professional, because KPIs are KPIs, then generally speaking, you tend to get the right outcome. Unless somebody is outside of the norm, which sometimes does happen and reacts anyway, then there's very little you can do. But at the end of the day, when you look in the mirror and you ask yourself, was I kind? Was I objective in my feedback? As long as you can tick those boxes, then you're fine. Okay. Let's, let's, let's go back to being CEO. Do you have like a morning routine? Yes, I do. I try to read the Bible every day on the app. Now that that's there, it, it does help. Um, just a verse, if I can, if, if necessary, more. And say my prayers and just plan for the day. I check what I have uh, in terms of the meetings that are scheduled and just to make sure that, that I'm able to turn up. I, I try to keep time. Uh, as much as possible, just so that that is also a, a demonstration of respecting other people because you have to respect their time too. And then at the end of the day, I have a routine with my family. If my daughter is around, uh, we'll spend some time together, my husband, my children, and then mm -hmm. close the day. So what time do you wake up? Between 5.30 and 6.30. 
Is that just during working days or even on weekends? Even on weekends, I wake up, but at weekends I lie in. I go back to yeah. sleep. I go back to bed and I just rest and relax. I try very hard not to do official things during the weekend unless I really have to, uh, because that's my way of of just balancing my life. Okay. And what time are you in the office? 7.30 to 8. 7.30 to 8. What is it like being CEO that others who are not CEO, those who are, you know, below you, never get to see? Because we just see the glamour or the car or the, you know, high level or <laughs> guest of honor or whatever. Like that's, that's the, the flowers, really. Yeah. But what really goes into being a CEO? And not just being a CEO, but being a successful CEO. Um, to my mind, it's the same. You know, um, in credit, uh, bank credit applications, there is an, an assessment that is carried out, right? And what you find is that when you're assessing a big paper and when you're assessing a small paper, it's the same thing. It's the same as being a CEO. You're still responsible for the entire organization. It's just the same thing. It's just that it's a bigger organization. That's all. So... I have a, res- a lot of respect for other CEOs. I even have a lot of respect for people who choose to stay home because that's the CEO of the home, right? It's the same attention to detail. It's the same just making sure that everyone uh, is given the, the opportunity to do their best. That's what it's all about. Yes, the responsibility is way heavy when it's bigger, but the routine is really quite the same. Okay. I'm going to ask you a question that you've gotten so many times. Mm. CEO, mother, wife, you've got other responsibilities. I cannot count. I'm, I'm, I'm sure you've sat in kitchen party committees, you know, <laughs> and there's all this away from just, you know, Zanako. Yeah. But how do you get it all together? Or do you feel like other areas in your life suffer because Zanako demands so much? Definitely, there'll be some areas that will suffer. And I won't know that because I only know what I know, right? But what I try to do is to balance it. So if my family needs me at a particular point in time, then it's almost like it's a spectrum. When Zanako needs me more, I'm there for Zanako. When my family needs me more, I'm there for my family. And I try to find that balance and make sure that at any point in time, I'm giving it my best shot and I'm present in the moment. So uh, sometimes I catch myself at home, I'm talking to my daughter or my sons, and they say, mom, you're on your phone. And I say, okay, I'm putting it aside. <laughs> Little things like that. And it makes a difference because then they know I'm paying attention to them completely and fully. I have a very supportive husband. Um, he allows me to be, you know. And I think that has been a critical piece in who I am today because he's just quietly supportive. He doesn't like the limelight. He doesn't want to be out there. He just says, you do what you have to do. We've only and seen him once. There. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he doesn't, he doesn't want to be out there. And he's happy. He's fine with it. So I think that's also a big part in, in balancing me out. And he has very strong opinions. He's very intelligent. So he'll share his views. I, I think you should do this here. Sometimes. And sometimes he just keeps quiet and lets me rant if I'm ranting or, uh, or just observes what's, what's going on. But he's a very, very strong support system. When you're overwhelmed with work, when you're stressed, how do you just calm down? What do you do? I read a book. I tend to read quite a bit. Um, I just, I like silence. You know, I'm not one of those who in the car, you have music raging. No, I just like silence sometimes just to think. I want to hear myself think sometimes. And just to allow for whatever it is that is causing me concern for me to just have that clarity in terms of what can we do. And prayer is, has a very strong calming, calming effect on me. And also sometimes just bouncing ideas off people who have been there before and um, have gone through it and just understanding how should we navigate this. That also helps. Okay. If you, if you had to write a book tomorrow, what, what, what would the book be about? 
Probably, you know, I've, I've actually considered it. I would write about the economy because I'm an economist. That's my grounding. And, um, you know, we've been through quite a lot as uh, Zambia. I'm not sure we have had this journaled from an economic perspective with the impact from a macro and micro level. It's nerdish, but that's what I'm interested in. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and the other thing I want to find out is what, what, what are some common myths that yeah. you've heard about CEOs? I don't know. Oh, you don't know? Mm. What myths? Oh, people don't tell you? No. Like, another thing where, like, you just think, like, ah, see, was, let me just have it easy. You just give instructions, you know, and then just <laughs> wait for feedback. Are you serious? <laughs> no, like, just, because most people haven't been. So, because you haven't been, you speculate, you create this assumption that this is how it is, this is how it is. And then when, well, God blesses you and you're there and yeah. you feel like, oh, okay, so that's actually not the case. I don't, I don't gossip much or subscribe to that kind of talk. So, and, and as a result of that, I, I don't tend to hear certain things. Okay. Uh, and I'm okay with that. And, and you're not very active on social media? No. And I'm okay with that as well. And, and, and what's the reason for that? I have to be authentic, right? So, I'm, I'm a quiet person. Why should I be loud on social media? To what end? Okay. Most young people who want to rise in organizations, yeah. what, what, what mistakes have you seen them make? I, I'm not sure that I've seen any consistent mistakes per se, but what I pick up, especially more recently, is a hurry. People are in a hurry. Um, and perhaps it's because of the instant gratification that has become the norm. So um, people think that it'll take a day or two to rise to the next level. It doesn't always work that way. It may sometimes, but I think um, part of that expectation means that you're unhappy with where you are. And so you don't enjoy the journey of actually getting there. So don't be in a hurry. That's my advice. Yes, be ambitious. Yes, apply yourself and be the best that you can be, but also allow for the journey to happen. Okay. Have you ever been passed over for promotion? Yes, a lot. How did you deal with that? Um, what I tend to do if I am passed over for anything is I support whoever it is that ends up in that position. So, for example, when I was passed over uh, for a particular role and someone else was appointed, I supported that person. But sometimes people, just knowing that you were the other person, they, they've already decided that it won't work. And that, that's been my experience sometimes. But other times you find that the person who ends up getting the, the job or whatever actually appreciates your support. So people are different, hey? And uh, at the end of the day, all you can be is the best of yourself. Okay, let's talk about changes. I was, I was talking earlier with one of your um, colleagues um, about change in organizations, mm. like leaving one organization, going to join the other. First of all, what, what should I consider when I want to switch from Zanako to Company X? What did you consider when leaving Not Safe to come here? You left Access Bank, you came here, you, you left other banks and today you're here. What, what do you consider to say, okay, I think this is the right move, mm. um, away from just the financial gain? I think Zanako is an amazing place to work. I must mention that. And um, Every day we have an opportunity to make it even better. And the reason why I'm actually excited about this institution is that it's ours, you know, as Zambians, it's our own. And it truly is. And we're here to serve the Zambian people. And so I wouldn't encourage anyone to leave Zanako. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not asking people who want to leave Zanako, yeah. but I'm saying... Other people, for example, who right. are in their organization right. and maybe they get an opportunity to go and work elsewhere okay. before I make the decision to leave. Yeah. What should I consider away from just, oh, the salary is better decide? It's about growth. You know, one of the jobs that I was offered, which I actually didn't take, was in an NGO, right? It was early in my career. Um, I was just a manager 
and they offered me a CEO role in an NGO. So I appreciated the fact that they considered me good enough at that point in my life to run that. But when I looked at the scope for further growth, in comparison with where I was, I couldn't see it. If I had taken that job, I would probably still be either in that role or in another similar role. I would never have been able to grow into a much larger portfolio. So those are the things that you need to think about. How far do you want to go? And it's okay if that's as far as you want to go to take that job. But if you want to go further, then look at scope for growth. So sometimes being a manager in a large organization is better than being CEO in a small one. Sometimes, but not always. I like that point that you mentioned. Um, we mentioned that you, you know, hire people, work with people. Have you ever been wrong about someone? Um, for example, you know, where you say ah, they're not good enough or you, you know, judge them a certain way and you realize that, okay, it's not actually what I thought they were. And later on, they, they prove you wrong. And, and what happened throughout that? And why I'm asking that is because sometimes we judge people too early and then we're very stubborn to stick to our original opinion about mm, them mm. and we never get to give them a chance to prove themselves. Yeah, um, I'm always open to that. Um, but it's very unusual for, for me to discover that I was wrong because by the time I make that judgment, I have to have facts. I don't make a judgment like that on the basis of emotion. I look at the history, the context, and only then do I make a judgment. So I don't rush to judge. So by the time I would have judged someone, I still will be open to the possibility. And then if they turn around my, my view, I'm very happy. If um, they don't, then it just uh, further uh, subscribes to the, the initial opinion. But I, I try to remain open-minded because that is part of the ecosystem, right? You should always allow for people to grow. And if you're going to allow for people to grow, then they will be able to make mistakes and pick themselves up. Don't overly judge. But most often, what I try to do is to give people three chances. So the first chance i'm saying it's a learning point if they do the same thing again and a third time then the likelihood is that uh, the judgment will be correct at that point okay as ceo um how easy is it for you to make a mistake or you are wrong about something like maybe work related or and maybe your subordinate was right how easy is it for you to go back and say, you know what, I made a mistake, let's do it your way? Oh, I love to do that. I actually like it when my people pick up on something and they're right and I'm listening and learning. And not even just my team, but even sometimes vendors, um, customers. You know, as we navigate the new technology uh, space, we, we set up a meeting with some of the... Uh, uh, PSPs, payment service providers, and we're learning together and co-creating uh, the best solution for the market. That excites me. So we'll say on one day, okay, this is our view as Zanako. And then one of the PSP uh, team members says, have you considered this? Happy to pick up on that idea. There is no one person who has the right answers. There's no one person who knows it all. We're all learning. We're all growing, so we have to remain open to that possibility. Only then will we really achieve the best together. Okay. What would you say has been the toughest decision you've ever made? Yeah, there have been several. Um, but I think people decisions I find difficult, especially when uh, it has to do with letting someone go. I try to avoid it. I don't like conflict. Um, but sometimes I have to deal with it. Those are my toughest decisions. And especially when you consider the family and all the rest of it. Those are hard. Yeah. Yeah. 
yeah, I yeah. get that. And 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 you make decisions every day as CEO. Mm-hmm. What is your decision making process like? Before you decide something, like how do you, you know, do you have like a ritual or something? No, there's no ritual. It's factual. So you look at the facts before you and you make the call on that basis. And you try to avoid any emotional decisions because then um, you can make the wrong decision. So just look at facts and be professional and remind yourself of that every day. What would you say you like about being CEO? The perks, what you talked about, the um, the fact that I think, and I, I think I even underestimated the opportunity to make a difference in other people's lives. Um, the other day, someone said to me, oh, because of you, I decided to do this. I was like, wow, someone has actually made a life decision because they just observed me from a distance. That is amazing. It's also such an honor and a privilege as well as a responsibility. So it means I need to be careful not to give the wrong signals because someone might just do something because they're observing me. So it works both ways. Okay, and the not so good side? That's the not so good side. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and you know, the other thing I wanted to find out um, from you is you are CEO um, and you've got all these people in the organization who look up to you. Um, what's your policy like? Do you have like an open door policy? Anyone in the company can walk in and say, I want to see the CEO or it's up. No, she's busy. She's busy. Come tomorrow. Come tomorrow. And it never happens. I have an open door policy, but I also have a very tight schedule. So I try to balance it. Remember, I said I don't I take other people's time seriously. So if someone wants to see me, we make an appointment. I keep that appointment and I meet them. And I take that seriously. Um, I also have engagements online with the team. I try to have one-on-one sessions with different people who make requests. And anyone can send me an email. Anyone can send me a WhatsApp. I respond within a, within 24 hours. Okay. So if I don't respond within 24 hours, then I have either a different opinion and I need to discuss or I disagree and we need to discuss or something, you know, oftentimes if I don't respond, people even say, oh, you haven't responded. What is it? They even come to me and they say, okay, this, this must be a problem. Or unless uh, maybe if I'm traveling or something and I am not able to then see it in good time, but I try to, to be responsive and to respect other people's time and to have anyone who needs to see me able to see me. Has it ever happened? Okay. Like this year, like just have one hour and there's nothing for you to do. No, <laughs> no, that's not likely to happen. But I, as I said earlier, when I'm relaxing, I do sit down and enjoy the quiet. So then there, it's not that there's nothing for me to do. I'm thinking. What was it like being led? And how is it like leading? Because you've experienced both sides mm. where you're being led, you're under someone, and mm. now you're at a point where you're not under anyone, or maybe the board and whatnot, but like in terms of staff, mm. like everyone is under you, mm. and you're at a point where you are under someone. Mm. What have you noticed is the difference in terms of attitude, for example? How, how is the Mukwandi that was being led, and how is Mukwandi the leader? I subscribe to servant leadership. So the leader is also being led. And I try to understand where the team may be coming from with whatever perspectives. So I don't take it that I'm at the pinnacle and I'm the one leading. I think we're leading together. And, and so I, I don't even notice a difference between the time when I was directly being supervised and the time when I'm now supervising others because it, it has always been that way. And there's a spiritual angle to it as well, because if I let God lead, then I'm still being led, so to speak. And uh, the board, of course, as you mentioned, uh, keeps a check on me. And the other leaders in the country, I'm still being led. What we're doing together with the team is delivering to the mandate that we have as an uncle. But we're being led together and we're leading together. Okay, what would you say you've noticed is like one of the, diff- the most difficult things about 
people management? Um, the most difficult part of people management is alignment. Because once you align, then it's, it's an easy conversation. So what I try to make sure of is that at the beginning of the year, we're aligned. What are the expectations? Mid-year, we're aligned. How are we doing? Year-end, we're aligned. How did we achieve? Once you do that, then people management tends to be quite straightforward. But if you don't have alignment, then that's where people become subjective. It becomes a whole conversation. This one doesn't like me or this one has what? has whatever agenda and all the rest of it. So those issues now come in. As a leader, how do you deal with that? Where <laughs> my boss, like you there, but mm. the people under these teams know the boss is pulling this direction. This one, no, that one, the boss doesn't like me. The boss is just doing this because no, the performance management was not fair because the, the appraisal. This is, and, and you've got those bickering and gossiping and whatnot and that one trying to put down that one. And, and you are there. And what you care about mostly is, guys, this is the direction we're going. Let's, Let's work together. Yeah. So I think, again, alignment. It's about aligning as a team. It's about aligning as individuals. What I try to do is to create the space for people to align. Because it won't do if I take sides, right? Because at the end of the day, I become what I'm trying to avoid. So I need to just facilitate for whoever it is that is disagreeing to come to a point of agreement. And the only way to do that is to communicate. So if someone has a complaint, I call in the other person and I say, okay, let's talk about this and get to a point of agreement. That's the only way. There's no shortcut to it. We have to communicate and ensure alignment. Otherwise, it will fester and fester and it will become destructive. Have you ever had someone come to your office and talk about another employee? Yes, I have. What I tend to do is I, I ask permission to call the other person into the room. It's good to do that because then everyone has an opportunity to explain where they're coming from. So if it's an issue that will impact the organization, I try to allow for everyone to have their say. So I'll call in the other person and say, what are we going to do about this? If you're, if you're ready to talk about somebody, you should be ready to tell them to their faces, whatever that opinion is. What would you say are the, your top three values? I think I'm quite honest. I like integrity. To the extent that we can as human beings, obviously we have our faults. I think um, I'm also quite consistent in uh, my family values and belief and my Christianity. I think I also work very hard and I'm diligent. So that would be a value as well. So those are the three that I would talk about. You know, the, in my previous, one of my previous roles, they did a strength finder. Uh, it's actually a statistical tool to assess your strengths. And these are the ones that came through quite strongly. But again, it's on a spectrum. We're human, we're fallible. Okay. And women in the boardroom, mm. how do you get more voices of women in boardrooms? I, I know organizations where there's no woman in the executive committee. Mm. And when I say that, I'm not talking about small, I'm talking about big organizations in the mm. country. There's no woman in the boardroom. Mm. It's just men. Um, we have examples like you. We have other women, you know, who are really trying to push this. But even then, it's still a struggle, mm. you know. Um, where do you think the problem is? Our society... Uh, doesn't encourage uh, women to lead and and have careers. It doesn't. That's the honest truth. It's changing and evolving, but still, you know, underlying it all, our society does not. And so that's the first thing, just the acceptance. The second is choice, you know, um, a lot of the time, even women who have the potential sometimes make choices to look after their families rather than pursue a career. It's unfortunate, but true that we're the caregivers in the community again. And sometimes that choice is just made. The third thing is, uh, to a certain extent, uh, there is a bit of a club effect in the boardroom. 
So people will look for people who are like them. And what we need to avoid is uh, pointing fingers at each other, but rather looking for the positives in each other. So rather than to say, you men, give us space, we should be able to demonstrate the value that we're able to bring to the table through diversity. And in so doing, improve the chances of women being appointed into positions in the boardroom. Okay. And, and talking about your management, um, would you say your management style has changed with positions? So, for example, your management style at, let's say, for example, if you're a branch manager, and when you are maybe regional manager and when you're CEO, would you say it's the same thing or because the span is growing, you also change how you manage? No, I think I'm the same person. I'm the same person that I was when I was a branch manager. Even though now it's much bigger. Yes. And why haven't you seen the need to change your style? Of leading? Because it has worked. <laughs> it has worked for me. Um, I, I focus a lot on people, my customers, my... Uh, my team. I'm, I'm a very people-driven person and it has worked for me so I, I have seen no reason to change that approach. Okay. And the first day you walked into Zanako, mm. you know, you've been appointed, first day you walked in, what was your, your, your running in your mind? You know, you meet the people, you meet these people, what was running in your mind? Were you Okay, I don't make this one billion, but where you like, we're going to break records here. How's it? And I, why I'm saying that is because it's, it's different going in an organization like at lower level. Because mm -hmm. I mean, no one even notice you, but everyone is looking at you now and saying, okay, let's see what this one's going to do. You know, and already you say being a woman, um, already there's this stereotype in the community. Mm -hmm. Here is a woman that comes, not just that she's Zambian. Earlier you mentioned they think you you know you are from outside. You just mm -hmm. come in. How was it? First day in Zanaku. First day, I, as, as you said, I had to meet the people, had to get to understand the philosophy of the organization, the opportunity to change and transform. And I study numbers. So I looked at the numbers, I looked at the historical and the opportunity, the strategic plan that was already there and what we could tweak. So I asked the board if we could tweak the plan but not change it. I, I don't believe that you need to just overhaul the whole strategic plan because then what are you saying, you know? So we tweaked it with the board and we implemented. And that's how we ended up where we are. But it starts with people, as I said earlier on. It's about alignment, it's about uniting the team, it's about identifying what the opportunities are, identifying the risks, and eliminating them as much as possible and mitigating them so that you, you keep going. And it's a journey, we're still on it. Um, we have come a long way, but we still have areas where we are still working to improve. There's always this thing that, you know, CEOs like to have their own people, you know, because you've worked with someone before and you feel like this person is, they deliver, you know, mm -hmm. they, they perform and others would prefer going with their own people. Mm -hmm. Others will, go in and change the culture with the existing people. Mm -hmm. Do you feel it's easy to change a culture? Because also I feel like that's what stands in the growth trajectory mm -hmm. of most organizations. Mm -hmm. is we have the, the plans on paper are beautiful. Mm -hmm. Someone was saying strategic plans, like every plan like looks, you know, but getting that plan to be actualized mm -hmm. is a whole different ballgame. Mm -hmm. And for most people, that's where they struggle. Because now the plan is there, but the culture are found here. You mm -hmm. know, it's like get Mukwandi and take her to a parastato, for mm -hmm. example, or take her in the civil service. Mm -hmm. The leader is okay, but the culture there is what's standing in the growth. How, do, how does culture change work? And have you ever faced a situation where you had to change culture for you to deliver results? Yes. Over and over again, and not just in uh, public sector. I have worked in a parastatal before, and I believe that we change the culture there. Um, even in the private sector, you have to constantly address cultural issues and norms. And... There is no organization that does not have its own DNA over the years. I mean, Zanako is 50 years old plus. There are certain habits that are ingrained. And then there are others that can, can adjust. So it's about identifying what we can change for the better, what we need to adapt to and, and accept for the time being, 
and what is good and we need to retain. I don't subscribe to throwing away everything that you find. I don't, I don't think that's a good thing. I think you can identify what you need to keep and you can identify what needs to shift and you can work with the team and bring in other people as well. Okay. So it's, it's a mix. What, what would you say has been the highlight of your career? I think the one billion when we achieved it was amazing. Uh, it was a major highlight. It, it, um, it was the first ever and it just, it just took us to another level as a team. And I was so grateful uh, to have been at the helm of this organization when that happened. Okay. What kind of questions do they ask for a CEO job in an interview? You know, I went through a series of interviews to get into this role. Um, and actually, I, 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 I didn't know whether I'd answer the questions correctly because there were such tough questions. But um, there, was, there was a team, a recruitment team from South Africa. It was a South African recruitment agency that handled the recruitment of in my role. Some of the questions they asked were really interesting you know um and they did psychometrics which were also very hard so i think that process was was quite grueling um but here we are i'm, I'm actually impressed you went through a whole interview because outside to us who watch you go like ah they just poached her <laughs> <laughs> no <laughs> they just poached her like, no come here. we've seen what you've done there i mean the number 15 number six come <laughs> You know, um, and also because you've built this brand, mm. so automatically there's the assumption that, ah, they just pushed her. You know, no, just doubled her offer and, you know, there she is. No, that's, that's not what happened. I went through an interview process. I went through a psychometric test and all the rest of it. And then the final interview with the board. And so the wh where do you go from here? You tell me. What do you think? Why I'm asking that is because at some point you reach a level where, like, you're CEO and... Do you feel like it, you, you will always have to be CEO or would you take a job as, I don't know, a director or a head of something and not CEO? Would you? I, I don't know, to be honest. Um, at this point, I'm so focused on where I am and what I'm doing that that is my primary uh, concern, so to speak. And what I'm also trying to do is to make sure that I develop myself so that I'm able to deliver completely and read and um, learn and grow with the team. I think after a couple of years, then I'll look at what options are available out there. Um, but I haven't really thought through uh, a specific role that, uh, that I would be looking at. The nature of who we are as human beings is that you broadly say, oh, okay, that organization, international organization or whatever, that would be nice. You know, but I haven't yet reached a point where I've said, okay, this one and this step and whatever. No, I haven't. Maslow's hierarchy of needs, there's self actualization at the top. Do you think you're there? No. Oh, not there yet? No, not yet. You had basic needs? No. Somewhere in the middle. <laughs> ah, sorry, <laughs> um, uh, the other thing I wanted to ask is it says that, that to whom much is given, much is you know, demanded. Yes. Um, your level of success is. It's like this light for many young people and they look at you and they want to be you, they adore you. But the truth is it's hard for them to come and drink from your cup because obviously you're very busy. They can't just walk in and say, no, ma'am, help me here, help me here. Do you still, you know, find time to, to reach out and mentor young people and help young people and, mm -hmm. you know, just show up for them? Because I believe that it's easier now to be more successful because we've got access to, you know, people like you. But then also people like you are busy. Like you said, even just someone who works in Zanako may have to make an appointment. Sometimes I know it can be moved or she's busy, she's got to travel. How, how do you still find time to give for other people? Because also it's like a personal CSR, for mm. example, where you mm. give back to the community, give mm. back to these young people. I'm a great believer in that. And just a few days ago, uh, we had a coffee chat with the youth some university students and um, people who are just starting out in their careers, they come together every so often and they ask me to speak and to engage them. I had such good fun. Um, 
at the end of the day, uh, we need to give back, you know, and not just me, but so many other people who in whatever it is that they are doing, they're able in some way to, to inspire others. And when you are given that, that honor, that privilege, you must give back. It's a responsibility to share uh, with others whatever it is that they may need. And one of the questions I was asked in that session was, what if no one learns anything? You know, what if, you know, how, how do you define success? You've spoken to us, but if we don't learn from you speaking to us, then what? And I said, it's their responsibility to learn from the process. And if out of that group of 50 youths, if just one, just one, become successful as a result of that talk, then I'm successful too. Because it's not even about a multitude. And I don't try to influence a multitude. I, I, it's not part of my personality. But just the one, just the 50, just the 100, that is what I'm looking for. Okay. As we come to an end, um, is there a question that you wished I asked you but no. I haven't. <laughs> Why are you saying that very fast? Because <laughs> there isn't. <laughs> okay, then I'll ask you one last one. Okay. What would be the five things you'd give as advice to young people who are trying to grow in their careers? Just five. Um, I will share the same message that I shared with the youth a few days ago. Whatever your vision is for your life, write it down. Start by writing it down. Implement, act on it with integrity. Um, make sure that in, you enjoy the journey. You're in the moment. Don't rush, as I said earlier on. Um, be ready to work with other people and team up. Respect everyone around you as you take on this journey. And at the end of the day, be yourself. You're unique. Allow yourself to soar and shine. Thank you. Cheers. My last question just came to my head. Yeah. I've noticed that most CEOs have an MBA from outside the country. Mm. When you look at two candidates trying to do an interview, you look at two candidates. One has an MBA from the University of Manchester, Manchester Business School. And then here is Jonathan. Um, well, I don't know any Jonathan, but here's Jonathan. Mm. And Jonathan has an MBA from Unza. Mm. Does the fact that this guy has an MBA from Manchester Business School, give him an upper hand over the guy with an MBA from Unza. To be honest, I don't think we look at where the MBA uh, was received from. We look at whether they have an MBA. But um, I agree with you that we do have a bit of um, a perception issue with regards to which university. So the likelihood is that they would both be considered. And if within that process they are so close, then issues such as those would come in, in a way. But I also believe that our own universities are just as good. Uh, I think we need to raise our institutions up and give them the credit for it. So much as, yes, it is considered that Globally, the ranking of the universities should count for something. And our local universities are not that highly ranked. I think there is, to a, to a certain extent, a responsibility on our, on our part to raise up our own. So there will be a bit of a view as regards the ranking of the university, but there is also a view as regards the local university. So they'll balance out. Okay. No, thank you very much for your time. <laughs> Promised you an hour, and it's actually a minute to an hour. Uh, thank you very much for, for your time. Um, for me, really, what strikes me the most about you is, is, your, is your persona. I feel like you're very warm, you're very welcoming. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, I've experienced it myself. Uh, the other time, you called me yourself to cancel the, 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 the appointment. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, it's bad. But look, she took it out. You know, she took out the time, you know, and I know that you're very busy. I could have understood if you just, you know, told, you know, Gillian, so you know, mm. just tell him we'll move and we'll get a date mm. soon. 
but for me, I think that's what matters. Because in, in Zambia, we've got too much bossiness. Mm. You know, everyone wants to carry around their title and threaten people and scare people around you. When, when, when the boss, like those days when you're growing up, when your father walks in, you run away, you know, mm, go to the mm, bedroom. Mm. But I like that um, yeah. about you, and I hope that you continue. Thank you. Humility is underrated, but it's actually part of who we are as human beings, you know? At the end of the day, what does it take to just pick up the phone and, because it was our second postponement, surely, handle it personally. No, this. no. Thank you so much. And uh, we, we will be in touch. Thank you. And thank you for the interview and thank you for listening. I see, the questions weren't hard after all. They were, but... No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> Do you need these back? No, no, thank you so much. <laughs>